Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder, rape, and suicide. This week, we're doing something a little bit different on the murder sheet. We recently covered the case of the McCrary-Taylor family, a clan of itinerant serial killers who largely targeted young women working alone at donut shops. Some of you let us know that you were especially interested in the case, and so we decided to dig a little deeper. We reached out to Don Williams, a retired lieutenant with the Santa Barbara Police Force. He is one of the last surviving law enforcement officers to have worked the case. At first, he wasn't sure what to think about us, but like any good detective, he did his research. I, I have never watched a podcast in my life. I'm an old-fashioned guy that can barely can fairly can barely do my emails. But uh, uh, when I when I Google when well, Kathy Googled you and, and showed it to me, and there was a list of shows that you had done, and they looked very interesting. And then when I hit that one about the uh, Winchell donut shop it just bang it just there i was right back into the case again this week on the murder sheet don and his wife kathy return to the mccrary taylor case and take us all with them my name is anya kane and i'm kevin greenley and this is the murder sheet a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the murder sheet, and this is the Donut Shop Killers behind the investigation. The crime which ultimately ended the Klan's reign of terror was a supermarket robbery that went horribly wrong. Well, I I was a detective, and uh, I I answered the call when uh, the information came out that the robbery had taken place and an officer was down, so I went directly to the scene. When I got to the scene, we found out that our officer had answered a silent alarm. And he had gotten to the grocery store uh, before the suspect, uh, later identified as Carl Taylor, came out of the store. He um, ordered Taylor to stop. But Taylor ignored him and took off running across the parking lot. Well, our officer was running behind him. And when Taylor got around into a residential area, he climbed up on a second-story balcony. And when the officer came around, he shot him in the head. A young employee of the store had also followed and when he found the officer on the lying on the sidewalk, he picked up his the officer's shotgun and started chasing after Taylor. He noticed that Taylor tried to get in the car, 
in a parking lot and then backed off and hijacked a woman driving through the parking lot. This kid uh, fired off several shots and blew out the windows of the car, but he, uh, Taylor was able to uh, get away out of the lot. What we didn't know at the time was that that car that Taylor had driven to the store had been left running in the parking lot. And a good citizen had passed by and turned the key off and put the keys on the floor mat. And that's why when he got to his car, he, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't flee any, in it. We got sidetracked on the investigation of McCrary and trailers, Taylor because we developed a suspect who was wanted for other armed robberies in the area. And when we showed his picture to seven of the witnesses who had been in the store at the time of the robbery, they all picked out this guy as the robber. His name was Frank Dodo, and he was a con man and a crook, and and a little and a, a, a town close by by Santa Maria had him as a suspect in the supermarket robbery that that uh, Carl that Carl Taylor had pulled because he looked so much like him, and <laughs> the poor guy he. He did everything wrong to make himself look like a sure, surefire killer. He was on parole, and he conned his parole officer into letting him use his car to supposedly go down to uh, Ventura, that's another town nearby, and apply for a job. So this parole officer let him take his car. Well, he never came back. <laughs> so... So what he had done was he'd gone to Los Angeles and he had been going there regularly and uh, passing himself off as this boxer, uh, Carmen something, I can't remember that. And he'd go into these bars down there in Los Angeles and and they, you know, they'd all hoop and holler there. So Carmen, that great boxer, and they'd buy him drinks and everything. And, so by the time he started home, uh, he was number one suspect, and you know, mm -hmm. and he didn't. He got as far as Santa Barbara when we had road, roadblocks up, and he was arrested. Well, it took about three days to get him cleared and checked out his alibi. Dodo felt quite grateful to Don for clearing him of involvement in the shooting of Officer Dennis Huddle. Suddenly, he became my best friend, <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't get rid of him. He called me from Las Vegas and say, listen, I, I'm running a couple of girls, and any time you want to come over and party, why, well, be my guest, you know. After you cleared it. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to repay it. <laughs> yeah. While he was in jail, he conned a, a dentist that was in there on sexual charges, out of uh, five hundred dollars, and told him he could he could get him counterfeit bills <laughs> in the thousands, you know, that he could use. That Dennis was an idiot too. But, uh, <laughs> he sounds he like was a character. Always, this con man, uh, Do Frank Dodo, was his name, and he was always on the con. Oh, he just couldn't. He just couldn't. He didn't have any other. Aspirations. <laughs> Investigators now focused on the car the robber had left behind in the market parking lot. We found out the car had been purchased in Long Beach, California for cash by Carl Taylor, but he had given a false address in Dallas, Texas. We were kind of stymied for a while at that until we got a call from a Edison employee who was turning on the electricity at two houses that had been rented by McCrary and Taylor. And he, when he called, 
we immediately set up plans to raid the Taylor house and found it to be unoccupied. The lights were on, the TV was on, and clothing and stuff spread around, including papers, but they had gone. We later discovered they had fled to Athens, Texas. Police discovered a crucial piece of evidence in the Taylor residence. We found the uh, vehicle that he had hijacked in the in the garage. So we knew we knew we had the right person. From there on, uh, the dominoes started falling down, and things started falling into place. Let's take a quick break from the murder sheet to tell you about a podcast investigating yet another unforgettable crime. The Orange Tree is a seven-part series about a 2005 homicide that happened near the University of Texas at Austin. The murder of 21-year-old Jennifer Cave, who was shot, dismembered, and left in a bathtub at her friend Colton Petoniak's apartment, continues to haunt the area to this day. Like the Burger Chef murders, this case features plenty of twists and turns, including Colton's flight to Mexico with another UT student, Laura Hall. Both were later convicted in connection with the crime, although Colton has continued to appeal his verdict and claim innocence. The business student turned convicted murderer now says that he doesn't even remember much about the night Jennifer died. The Orange Tree is reported on and produced by Haley Butler and Tanu Thomas, who were both seniors at the University of Texas when they started this project. Together, Haley and Tanu strive to piece together this tragic story in an in-depth podcast that features audio from courtroom scenes and interrogation rooms, prison phone calls, and exclusive interviews with both the perpetrators and the victim's family. You can binge all seven episodes of The Orange Tree today on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to the murder sheet. After leaving the Taylor house, the next stop was obvious. We then went to the McCrary house and interrogated and and arrested uh, Sherman and his wife, Carolyn, and and their son, Danny, and contacted uh, Athens. Sherman told us he thought he that Carl had gone to Athens, Texas, where he had relatives. So we had the Athens, Texas police uh, alerted, and they arrested Ginger and Carl. So we went to Athens and brought them back to Santa Barbara. Meanwhile, we had put out the information on this family, and we began to get re- responses from all over the United States. We figured that uh, we had a total of 22 homicides that they were responsible for, from Florida to Oregon, all across the Midwest. And that didn't come out to us because they were none of our our uh, cases until the detectives from Mesquite, Texas came out and interviewed and found out that they were responsible for a killing in Mesquite, Texas. Don would later learn the details of many of those killings straight from one of the murderers. We uh, went up to Folsom, me and my partner, and interviewed McCrary. And he detailed seven murders that they were involved in, including the one that you've used in one of your podcasts of the girl who was taken out of a uh, donut shop in, uh, I think it was Utah, I'm not sure. But anyway, we had used that, that particular scene in the movie where the two women, the two wives, had been in the back seat of the car when the two guys took this girl out and assaulted her and and killed her. What was it like to talk with Sherman and have him tell you all about the murders? Very easy. We had certain rules. He didn't want us to record the conversation. And he, he was... 
a big liar to begin with. But the the cases he told us about, we were able to confirm with the, with the jurisdictions involved. But, of course, he never did anything. It was all Carl, and all he did was ride along with him, you know. But that was a bunch of hooray because in the Mesquite, Texas case, he found a pair of 46-size boxer shorts shorts. (laughs) and (laughs) Sherman was a big fat guy (laughs) wow (laughs) jeez but uh, also uh, he made up excuses why the victims were shot with two guns he kept telling us that that that's because he kept giving his gun to Carl who shot both of them uh, both guns into these uh, bodies and that didn't compute at all. Bragging. But he was very friendly. But he wouldn't talk to the FBI because I think he knew there was so many other cases across the United States that they were looking into. So why did he talk to uh, you? We don't know. You're good old He just, just sent notice to our department that he wanted to talk to the two investigators that he had dealt with. And so we immediately... Went, went to Folsom Prison and, and had about a five-hour interview with him and where he laid out these seven murders in seven different cities. Did he, did he give you much detail about those murders? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. He also detailed a, many armed robberies that they had pulled during their nomad travels. Yeah, he... He was very blunt about the, the uh, actually it was uh, six girls and one guy, one husband and one of the girls. But disturbing, very disturbing. His descriptions were very disturbing. I just never, <laughs> excuse me, I, 33 years in the police business, I had never heard anything like that sitting there listening to them to him detail how they took these girls out what they did to him and, and eventually killing them did he give a sense of like why they would kill these victims over such a little amount of money in most of these robberies they were just evil people a whole family uh, criminals to the hilt but evil criminals right I, 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 to this day, can't understand how anybody could be that bad of a person. You said they committed uh, other armed robberies. Do you have a sense of how, why sometimes they would kill people and other times they wouldn't? No, the only time they would, the only ones that he told us that they killed were girls working in donut and toddle shop type places where they would go in and get coffee and find the girl by herself. Uh, the only exception to that was the double killing in Mesquite, Texas of a husband and wife. They owned a little convenience store and uh, they, they stopped there for cigarettes and it was, they were the two people were alone in the store so they just Took them out, but yeah, robbed the store and transported them to a, to an old barn on a farm that Carl Taylor had lived on years ago. And that's where they assaulted the lady and killed both of them. What were the members of the McCrary Ta- Taylor family like? They were like <laughs> old. Uh, an old, close family that had no morals at all. And uh, the, women did with the, the two women uh, later on gave us a lot of information. Did the, uh, did the women of the family give any sense of, like, how they could just sit by and, like, watch their husbands do this? Oh, you know, uh, on that case that you had, where, where you end on your podcast where 
the women were present and watched it. The the old lady, Mrs. McCurry, she told us that she didn't go out and side with the girl. She sat in the back seat and read her Bible and prayed. Oh my God! I uh, I wanted to slap her out of the chair. <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> But and like so many of the cases going on across the United States right now, I was able to uh, control myself barely. How does it affect you emotionally to work on a case like this? Still does. It, it must be really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Still does. Just talking about it again. Did Did you know the officer who they wounded uh, in Santa Barbara? Yes. That's a sad case. He was seriously injured with uh, brain damage, but he he survived several operations and actually got back on his feet again, but he had no memory, and it bothered him. And he would be walking around the streets of Santa Barbara, stopping people and asking them, excuse me, Asking them if they, they knew him. Yeah, you know, he'd only been married three weeks when it happened. So when we did the movie, he insisted on coming down because he wanted to see what had transpired. I tried to discourage him from it. And as a result, he came back to Santa Barbara and killed himself. I'm sorry. That's kind of hard on me. I'm so sorry, Mr. I'm, Williams. I'm so sorry. But it certainly was a story that should be told. A lot of people, of course, how long ago it was, not very many people probably remember it. If it hadn't been for Columbia Studios, Making and Trembley. A, uh, huh? Trembley had the connection with Joseph yeah. Wamba. Yeah, uh, I don't know whether you remember, but Joseph Wamba is a re, was a author. He was a sergeant on the L.A. Police Department, and he started the television series Police Story, and they only used actual cases. They didn't make up anything. Uh, Somehow they got wind of our case and they got a hold of my chief and asked him to let me come down and tell them the story. And they made a two-part movie out of it, television movie. It's called The Odyssey of Death. <clears throat> Did somebody play you in the movie? Yeah, uh, Robert Stack played me. <laughs> he was one, one, of, one of my favorite actors. I spent a lot of time with him, enjoyed it very much. I I was the uh, technical advisor on the film, and so I was there from start to finish of the filming. So what what was the experience of working on the movie like? Well, having never been involved in anything like that, it was uh, quite interesting. Uh you know, you think of a movie as being start to finish. Well, that's not how they film these movies. They they do them piecemeal. I mean, they may do scenes from the ending uh, uh, in, early in the uh, filming. Yeah. In your estimation, uh, how did Mr. Stack do with his uh, portrayal of you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, there was a, he did an... Uh, news article, uh, an article in the TV guide, I think it was one time. Uh -huh. And he said it was the hardest part he ever played because generally he played the police that he played were deceased. And he said when he every time he looked up and saw me <laughs> standing there watching it, it worried him. <laughs> <laughs> Worried if, if he was doing a good job. Well, he was. He did a terrific job. 
was the movie accurate? Well, they took a lot of uh, liberties because, you know, this was, uh, we used the seven cases that I told you about as uh, the catalyst, and they were done over uh, a year's time. So they combined some of them. They took liberty in, in combining some of them, but the ones... But they, yeah, it it was accurate. It just wasn't, uh, it just wasn't chronological like it actually happened. Don's wife, Kathy, got the opportunity to make an appearance in the movie. I played the dead body in the movie. Huh? I played the dead body. Oh, yeah. My wife said uh, she got to play a dead body in the movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> that oh, that's wild. Pair, uh, they dark. had the pair of uh, uh, Five dollars. Yeah, forty. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. On that shopping there. Well, we were, we were filming uh, uh, a case where a girl was. The one at the donut shop in Colorado. Huh. Lakewood, Colorado, the donut shop. Yeah, yeah, the Lakewood, Colorado. Well, that's what they call it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the extra that was to come. She did all the stuff. It had to be a blonde girl, and they had her covered with a blanket because, uh, and her hair sticking out. And my wife had long blonde hair, and the, and the girl didn't show up. The extra didn't show up, and they had to, they were holding up the uh, filming until... Uh, Till the uh, uh, director saw Kathy sitting, so she had come down to watch him, and he asked her if she would be in that. That's her. <laughs> that's her. Uh, Forty-five minutes under that yeah. whole blanket. <laughs> <laughs> but when when uh, Robert Stack pulled the blanket back. What did they say to you? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> of course, her eyes came wide open at that point of time. <laughs> I wasn't okay. any doubt. It was very much alive looking into his eyes. <laughs> Even Don got a cameo in the film. I had a scene in it. Uh, <laughs> with, oh, you were uh, sitting at the bar. With, uh, uh, at, at the bar with Mark Peters. Yeah, he, he was... He was uh, he played my partner, and it, uh, and I had a I got to sit at the bar with drinking and smoking your favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a, <laughs> in those days. I I don't do either one anymore, but but I, I sat there with uh, Rob Peters and uh, Robert Stack. Yeah, Robert Stack. <laughs> I, I was sitting there at the bar with Robert Stack and Brock Peters, and uh, I got to. I, was, I show my kids, you know, and her dad was an actor with, the, with, some, with, some, with some famous stars. You know. That's pretty but, cool that uh, you both got a, a part. We could not find the film, Odyssey of Death, available anywhere to stream. But if you are interested in checking it out, you can find it on the Season 3 DVD set of Police Story. Do you um, think that there's anything that, you know, uh, as you mentioned, like it's not a super well-known crime today. Um, what what do you think people should take away from this when they learn about it? And, you know, what can we sort of chew on today, I guess, in terms of what happened here? Well, in the first place is there's some terrible, evil people out in the world. That, and no redeeming them. Yeah, uh, with very little redeeming value, and uh, and families are involved in it, not just individuals. You know, all these girls were taken. That McCurry told us about. They they all worked by themselves at night in these little one one employee donut shops, coffee shops. Or, and uh, just wasn't safe on them because there are so many predators out there. We would like to thank Don and Kathy for taking the time to talk to us and for making the effort to prepare for the interview beforehand. Yeah, I'm the only one on the investigating group that, that are still alive. And uh, so I didn't have anybody to 
to uh, uh, consult with. Luckily, I have not. But luckily, my beautiful wife had, had kept all that stuff and had it in chronological order in an album. And it was so easy just to go through from the start to the finish and make a few notes or to uh, remind myself. But I've probably taken up too much of your time now. You... This has been really, really yeah. fascinating. Yeah. We really appreciate it. We so appreciate it. I mean, we just appreciate you guys taking the time and everything. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.